for our life lesson today. I'm thrilled to introduce to you four of our staff team members here at Seoul, Andrew, Mike, Steph, and Piper. Together they'll share from Mark chapter 1 as we look into the new year and see how we can live this new year while drawing closer to Jesus, living a life of discipleship. They're not going to give you any easy answers. They're not going to give you some simple New Year's resolutions, but rather they'll challenge you in your faith and in your devotion to God. Before I turn it over to them, allow me just to brag on our staff team really quick. We have a young team here at Seoul, but a team who's up for any challenge that we throw at them. Uh, hearing them uh, as they recorded this, I'm, I'm thankful for the, their gifts of teaching. I'm thankful for their gifts of leadership in their ministry areas. I'm thankful uh, for everything that they bring to the table here at Seoul. We've been gifted with an incredible team of young leaders who lead in humility, grace, and love. Next time you have the chance, just share your appreciation for them with them. Maybe fire them a text after their life lesson today. Anyways, with that said, over to our team. Good morning, Soul family, and Happy New Year. If we haven't met yet, my name is Andrew, and I'm the student ministries pastor here at Seoul. I love that final song we sang together this morning, the hymn, Come Thou Fount. Hymns often have such rich lyrics full of imagery and meaning. And there's one line in particular that always stands out to me in that song. It says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I've come. Now, some of you may be familiar with what an Ebenezer is, but if you're unsure as we sing that together this morning, let me fill you in on what Robert Robinson, the writer of Come Thou Fount, was referencing back when he wrote it, wrote the song in the 18th century. He was referencing a story from 1 Samuel 7, and we're going to read that together this morning, picking it up in verse 7. It says, When the Philistine rulers heard what is, that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their armies and advanced. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel, and the Lord answered him. Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites defeated them. The men of Israel chased them from Mizpah to a place below beth -car, slaughtering them all the way along. Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshana. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help, for he said, Up to this point the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and didn't invade Israel again for some time. And throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. By placing this Ebenezer, which meant stone of help, Samuel wanted the Israelites to remember, not just for a few days, but for years, for decades, and for generations. He wanted them to look back at the stone as a reminder of how God had come to rescue his people when they humbled themselves before him. They were vulnerable with their enemies approaching, and they didn't deserve God's rescue, having repeatedly been unfaithful to him. But God didn't leave them. He continued to love them, to be faithful, and he rescued his chosen people. I don't know what your year has been like. I think that for many people, it's been a difficult year. And understandably so. I, I relate to that. In many ways, this has been the hardest year of my life. However, I wonder, no matter what your year has been like, what your Ebenezer moments have been. I'm not asking you to ignore, neglect, or try pushing down the difficulties or hardships that this last year has brought. But I do think that in times of difficulty or busyness, which is where we often find ourselves, we can have a hard time remembering God's faithfulness. And it's in those moments that we need to remember what God has done. We need our own Ebenezer. We need to take a step back and reflect on where God has been at work, where he's carried you through, and, and all the things he's done for you and the things he's given to you. So, family, as we turn the page on a new calendar year, I encourage you to remember. Take some time. Maybe write it down or talk it through with those closest to you. Don't just go new year, new me, or try to write off last year as a COVID year. Rather, start this new year by remembering what God has done. Maybe even find something to be your Ebenezer, a reminder for when times inevitably get difficult again. 
That's our first of four ways to approach 2022 with Jesus, to remember. And what should our response be when we remember what God has done? I believe that our response should be one of celebration and thanksgiving. John Tyson says this about celebration as a response to our cynical culture, or a culture where we just assume the worst about everything and everyone. He writes, I know it may seem like an interesting juxtaposition. Celebration and cynicism? Why not joy-resisting cynicism or hope-resisting cynicism? But celebration is explicit. It's defiant. Not only does it recognize who God is and what he's doing, but it also calls for a response. Celebration is a godly defiance in a culture of doubt. He goes on to write that we often talk about spiritual disciplines as key to our faith. But could it be that in a cynical world like ours, the key is not the celebration of discipline, but the discipline of celebration? Making sure we commit to celebrating the good God that we serve. I think John Tyson might be on to something. While spiritual disciplines are certainly important and hope and joy are undeniably necessary in a world of negativity, celebration could be the key and a response to the hope and the joy that God gives us. You see, celebration directly opposes the negativity that's so pervasive in our culture. And it causes us not only to remember what God has done, but it also forces us to respond with thanksgiving. And I think that celebration is contagious. When we celebrate and tell others about the good things that God is doing in our lives, it spreads the hope, joy, and positivity that our world so desperately needs. I also believe that there's something to be said about celebrating together and celebrating each other. When we look to the Bible celebration, which we learned in youth uh, right before Christmas, is actually a very common theme, was something done with one another. It was something done in community. The Israelites actually had all sorts of celebrations and festivals where they remembered together what God had done for them. And the Bible is full of exhortations to build each other up rather than tear each other down. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, it says, So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So there's all sorts of things to celebrate within our community. If you're on our email list, you got an email this last week about things we're celebrating together. In fall 2021, we launched 28 life groups with 265 unique adult group members and started six women's discipleship groups with an intentional focus on spiritual formation. We also reached out to our city and to our world. We saw 144 different kids show up to our kids' camps, with nearly three-quarters of them from outside of the Seoul community. We gave over $75,000 to our missions partners, and if you were with us over the Christmas season, you may have seen that our giving tree was a huge success. We were able to restock Living Word's pantry with what was given by our church community. I had the opportunity alongside a couple other staff to load up the food with one of the staff from Living Word last week, and he was overjoyed with how this was going to help so many people in our city. And I'm sure there's lots of things that God is doing in the lives of individuals in our community as well. Soul, whenever we take time to celebrate, whether personally or communally, we are bringing the glory of God into the brokenness to the world around us. We're accurately representing the God we serve and offering tangible grace to the whole world. So I encourage you to take some time as we start this year to remember what God has done. What are your Ebenezer moments? And then respond to those moments with celebration and thanksgiving. We know every breath is a miracle, a gift given to us by our Creator, and every new year is a testimony to grace. So the proper response when we look back at this past year, whether good or bad, is not, I made it through, or look what I've achieved. Rather, it is, thank you, Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name's Mike. If you don't know me, I'm the Discipleship Director here at Seoul. Moving on from what Andrew just spoke on concerning the importance of remembering and how it should lead us to celebration and thanksgiving, we're going to now look at the act of repentance. If you have your Bibles, head to the Gospel according to Mark, where we'll look at chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Mark writes, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the Gospel of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, 
The word repent has been, for quite some time now, one of those Bible words that's lost its original meaning and been replaced with something different. Even for me, I typically associate the word repent with soapbox preachers condemning people passing by by their lifestyle and calling them to turn from their evil ways lest they face the fires of hell. I've only experienced this, though, in movies about some end-of-the-world event, but I know there are people who have experienced this word in this way firsthand. This word's been used as a means to point to the bad in people's lives and to the bad eternal destination they face if they don't change. However, that's not what Jesus does here. Rather, Jesus points to what he calls the kingdom of God, and it's because of the reality of this kingdom, Jesus turns and invites people to repent and believe the gospel, the good news. Due to our cultural understanding of the word repent, I think the best way to understand it and apply it to our lives today is to first look at and understand what this gospel or good news is, because it's only in this understanding can we truly respond in repentance. To start, the Greek word translated as gospel or good news is euangelion, and this isn't just a biblical word, but one used throughout history. One way this word was used around the first century was in royal proclamations. One inscription found in modern-day Turkey was created to honor Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire and the emperor at the time of Jesus' birth. In it, they praise him as a god. Augustus was viewed as the son of the god Julius Caesar, who was deified after his death, and he was also praised as a savior for ending wars and bringing peace. In the final sentence, they state that, quote, the birth of the god Augustus was the beginning of the euangelion, the good news for the world that came by reason of him. The Bible conveys a similar but different kind of good news. When Jesus invites his listeners to repent and believe in the good news of the kingdom of God, he and every first century Jew with an earshot would immediately remember God's works and the overarching story being told in the Old Testament. Starting in Genesis, they would recall that Yahweh God created a good world and created humans to co-rule together with him as they submitted to his wisdom, reflecting his image into the world. However, humanity broke this relationship with God and each other when they believed the lie that humans could determine what was good and bad without God. This decision plummeted the world into chaos, violence, and death as humanity began operating off their own definitions of what is good and not good. This only furthered the relational breakdown between humanity and God and between each other. God, though, in his love and grace, rekindled relationship with a particular group of people, the Israelites. And through their story and their prophets, God announced to the world that there would come a day when evil would be dethroned in the world and in the hearts of humanity, and that God would rule in wisdom and love once again. We see this good news of God's coming rule and kingdom throughout the prophets of the Old Testament. It's this good news that the prophet Isaiah points to when he proclaims, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. God continues speaking through Isaiah, saying, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Now, I think we're supposed to actually stop here and ask, when the kingdom of God comes, who is going to reign, God or his servant? And the answer is yes, yes to both. Isaiah then moves to describe what kind of king this God's servant would be, saying in Isaiah 53, uh, starting at the end of verse 2, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We see here a very different kind of king. Not a king who comes in violence, subduing his enemies like the emperors of Rome, but a king who comes in humility to die for his enemies, breaking the cycle of chaos, violence, and death with grace and love. And it's this very king the gospel writers and Jesus himself are proclaiming Jesus to be. All of this now ought to inform our understanding of the word repent. The proclamation of a new king in charge means a new way of life. And when Jesus invites his listeners to repent and believe in this good news, he's presenting a choice. To continue living under the rule of the kings and kingdoms of this world or to repent and return to God. Choosing life under the rule of the true king and savior of the world, the God servant Jesus of Nazareth. Today, the kingdoms of this world look different than a physical kingdom like the Roman Empire, but its effects of broken relationship with God and others are the same. If we live with ourselves or something other than Jesus at the center of our lives, we are living in a kingdom contrary to the kingdom of God, and the choice Jesus presents here is for us. If you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, to repent means taking that first step and recognize Jesus for who he is the true king of the world who offered himself so that we might find freedom from our destructive ways by living life in God's kingdom. For those who are followers of Jesus, repent means continuing the process of rooting out the areas of our lives that don't align with Jesus and his way of kingdom living. Practically, this looks like spending regular time in prayerful self-examination, asking the Holy Spirit to highlight areas in our lives that don't line up with life in the kingdom of God. And when he reveals something in our lives, we're called to humbly repent by submitting to his rule and way of living rather than our way and the world's. And this process can't stop here by simply becoming aware of an area of life out of sync with Jesus. The Spirit wants to draw us further, and he can do so in many ways, but a common way is through confessing these things to another trusted follower of Jesus and then actively taking steps to turn from this false way of living and begin to live as citizens of the kingdom of God as he seeks to renew every area of our lives. So Soul Sanctuary, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Thank you so much, Mike, for all that you shared. If we haven't met, my name is Steph, and I am the worship director here at Seoul. So I grew up in Northern Ireland, but I've been in Canada now for about four and a half years. It'll be five in July. So I lived in Ontario for two years, and then in July of 2019, I moved to Winnipeg. And when I moved here, I had two suitcases full of clothes. I had a bike that had been given to me, and I also had a box of books. And I didn't really have a lot because my stay in Canada was only meant to be 10 months for an internship. But so like accumulating furniture, wasn't something I, I, I did. But one of the first things I bought after moving here was this really cute IKEA nightstand. I was so excited about it, but in my excitement, I actually forgot that I would have to build it myself. Thankfully, one of my upstairs neighbors, she agreed to help me, but even with her help, it was still this long, laborious, tedious process. And I know what you're thinking, like, Steph, this is an IKEA build. It's pretty straightforward. You just need to follow the instructions. And and we did for the most part, but after a couple hours, my nightstand was almost perfect. Everything except the bottom drawer. So my roommate and I, we decided, Ikea, they have given us faulty parts, and we just called it a night. In my inexperience of building any type of furniture, not even thinking Ikea, I expected this to be a 20-minute job. But it took us way longer than we anticipated. It was putting things together, then going back to the instructions, and then putting another piece together, and then repeating that process. And I wonder if you've ever felt like that in your walk with Jesus. That transformation and renewal should be this instantaneous thing, when in reality it's building, then going back to the instructions, and building some more, and then going back to the instructions. If you got your Bible, turn with me, and we're going to pick up where Mike left off in Mark chapter 1, verse 16, and it says this. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. 
A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in the boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. There are a couple ideas that I want to pull out of this passage, and all of them revolve around this idea of renewal. The definition of renewal means to make new, to restore to freshness, vigor, or perfection. That's a really powerful concept when you think of it in light of our relationship with Jesus, that he is restoring us to perfection. If we look at the words he actually speaks to Andrew and Simon, he says, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. Right at the start, notice Jesus' words are a direct invitation, come follow me. It's this invitation into something that is completely new, but with that invitation into the new, there is a call to leave behind the old. And to be renewed with Jesus means to forsake. It means to forsake our old ways, the ways of the flesh, and choose to pursue the path that he has for us. Often I think we read these words that Jesus speaks to disciples here, oh, and we only see the radical call for them to leave their livelihood behind, but There's also something to be said that Jesus is asking the disciples to allow their identity, their status, their worth to be determined in relation to him. And that is what he asks of us as well. In culture, on social media, and even in our closest relationships, we're often pulled a million different directions. We are told who we need to be and how to live. However, the call of Jesus is to live counter to that to let his word and his presence transform us and inform us of who we are and what our purpose is. It is to forsake the empty promises of earth and live a life that is in pursuit of the kingdom of God, a life that pursues biblical goodness, gentleness, kindness, love, peace, and self-control. In Romans 12, we read this. It says, "And and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is the true way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A significant proportion of who we are is determined by our thought life. What we think and how we think matters. And that's one of the reasons why God speaks it so directly in Scripture. The word for transformation or transform that is used here is describing a metamorphosis. It's a glorious transformation. Uh, However, it is a transformation that requires us partnering with the Holy Spirit, living in submission to his authority and his word. It's a gradual process. Notice Jesus' words to the disciples in the book of Mark. I will make you fishers of men. It's not that once they decide to follow him, they understand everything completely. If you actually look at Jesus' interactions with the disciples in the gospel, frequently he is teaching, correcting them, and leading them in new ways of thinking. And it's the same for us today. Part of the process of renewal is this act of trust. It's difficult to move from the old to the new if you don't trust the one who is asking you to do so. Following Jesus means trusting and believing that his way is better than what the world can offer. And without assuming too much, I wonder if that is what Andrew and Simon Peter saw in Jesus as he extended his invitation to them. That somewhere in that call, there was a better way than what they had been offered before. In my own life, I'm actually learning a lot about what trust in God looks like. And the more I learn, the more I recognize that trust is something, much like my Ikea nightstand, that is built. It's a muscle that needs to be strengthened. Trust, it comes with practice. And some of the practical things that help us to build that trust are consistent practices, such as spending time in scripture, spending time in private worship, and being obedient to the things that God asks you to do. Part of this process of being made new is also called to persevere and pursue. If we look back to my escapade building my Ikea nightstand, we had some instances of, oh, this part doesn't go here, or, oh, what did the instructions say again? Our Christian walk can often be like that. We feel, we get it wrong, but that does not mean that God is done with us, but rather we decide to keep going, knowing that God will continue his good work in us until we are complete as we partner with him. Renewal is lifelong, but it's also instantaneous. We are made new in Christ, but we're also being made new. It's because of this we are called 
to press on in a world that feels like it's getting more exhausting by the day. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. It can be so common for us to sit and listen to a Sunday morning message, and that's where it stops. Even more so, I would argue, with church online, you know, you can bring out your phone and scroll Instagram. However, for us to strip out every weight that slows us down, it means actually putting the word of God into practice. So what does it look like this week for you to love your neighbor? What does it look like for you to make your faith your own? Because that's what renewal looks like. It is moving beyond hearing. It is trusting. It is persevering. It's the process of faithful practice over a long period of time. Good morning, everyone, and a happy Sunday. My name is Piper, and I lead our Young Life Junior High Youth Ministry on Friday nights and Sunday mornings. So shout out to all the Young Life students joining us online this morning. Thank you to Pastor Andrew, Mike, and Steph for teaching us on the first three ways that we can become closer to Jesus as we enter this new year of 2022. But moving on from remember, repent, and renew, the fourth R this morning is rest. The culture we live in promotes busyness, especially around the start of a new year. If you're someone who takes breaks and rests, then you can be viewed as lazy or not working hard enough because our culture equates busyness with success. And this is amplified when we look towards entering a new year. In my own life, I definitely like to keep busy. I like to jam pack my schedule full of activities and I do this because I also used to see laziness, see rest as laziness. I can remember back to my first year of university when I was committed to a number of different things. And this time it was very busy for me and I loved it because I felt very useful and successful. And while sometimes you can love being busy and you can feel very productive because the culture around us promotes busyness, but if you choose to not take intentional breaks and moments of genuine rest, then you will become exhausted. And this is so true in my own life. When I'm striving for good grades, taking on extra responsibilities, signing up for extracurricular activities, or spending the holidays constantly busy with something, the things that suffer are those of modeling agape love to my neighbor. The term agape love refers to unconditional love. And when I find myself constantly busy, showing this unconditional love to my neighbor, it suffers, along with showing Christ's compassion to all and spending time with God because I've become like the exhausted culture around me rather than living a life set apart. Christ knew that our human bodies need rest. When we look to scripture, we can see the first three R's modeled. We learned about remember, repent, and renew. And we also see that Jesus modeled rest. In Mark 1, verses 35 to 38, it says this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. You see, in the midst of Jesus's ministry, when he was teaching, preaching, performing miracles, and spending time with his disciples, Jesus took time to rest. In the midst of a very busy season for Jesus, he recognized the importance of genuine rest for his body. And this included time alone with the Father in prayer. And in the book of Genesis, we see that God modeled rest. We know that God created the earth and everything on it. God worked hard. We see that in scripture. And after he'd created everything, he said, this is good. But in Genesis 2, verses 2 to 3, it says this. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work and creating he had done. The creator of our bodies knows their limitations and what overwork can do to us. He knows that when you spend all day, every day busy with something, you'll be get, you will get sick and become exhausted. 
From the beginning, he modeled a rhythm of taking intentional rest and alternating rest with work. And he called this a Sabbath. And so as we enter this new year, Soul Sanctuary family, a time that can be extremely busy for everyone, I encourage you to rest in two ways. First, we rest in our identity in Christ. Resting in our identity in Christ is about looking towards scripture to see who God says we are and placing our worth in those things rather than looking for our worth or value in the things of this world. Scripture outlines that we're deeply loved by God in Romans 8 verses 38 to 39. It outlines that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God in Psalms 139 verses 13 to 15. That we've been set free in Romans 8 verse 2 and Ephesians 1 verse 7. And that because of Christ, your sins are forgiven in Romans 3 verse 23 to 24 and Romans 8 verse 1. And these are only a few of the promises Christ makes about our identity and worth in the Bible. And so a more successful or busy or productive 2022 will not change or impact the way that Christ views you. The fullness of your daily planner and schedule does not make you more valuable to Christ. Instead of us packing our schedules full in this season, let us rest in our identity in Christ. And the second form of rest is physical rest. We can remember that rest is, is not a sign of weakness or laziness, but something that Christ models to us in scripture, because our bodies, they need physical and genuine rest. Rest is a form of worship. When we choose to rest, we, we entrust our lives to the grip of our sovereign God. To sleep is to say that we're not God and that the world can go on without us. And so in this season, Soul Sanctuary family, when you find yourself molding to the culture of busyness, remember that our creator knows our bodies need rest. And he modeled this for us in scripture. As we make plans for 2022 and look forward to this new year, let's remember to rest in our identity in Christ and take moments of physical rest to be able to effectively model agape love to our neighbor, show compassion to all and live a life set apart from the culture around us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do for us, Jesus. We pray that as we enter this new uh, new year, God, that you would just highlight to us the areas where we can become closer to you, God. And we pray these precious things in your name. Amen. In ancient times, the one who gave the blessing extended his hands and those receiving the blessing did likewise. And so Soul Sanctuary family, as you go entering this new year of 2022, may you spend time remembering where God has been at work, where he has carried you through, and think of all that he has done for you and given to you. May you repent from continuing to live under the kingdoms of this world and return to God, choosing to live life under the rule of the true king and savior of this world. May you renew through a continual transformation process, which moves beyond hearing and into faithful practice of following Christ. And may you make time for rest this year, both in your identity in Christ and follower and follower and genuine physical rest. Go soul sanctuary and enter the new year of 2022, all while becoming closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.